the defensive part for the second week of July 2020. This week, the party count their pennies and figure out whether, if they all chip in, they can have a podcast about groups buying games. The Adventure Party, discussing tabletop and related gaming the Irish way. Uh, welcome to the party. It's me again, Savage Mick. I'm Owen. I'm Shane, and I'd like to introduce everyone to my clone from the past. Oh, I'm also Shane. Yeah, exactly. He's, 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 he fits all the criteria to be my exact duplicate. Still uh, still working out the, the kinks on that uh, cloning process, eh? Yeah, you know, it's a... Such as the, the temporal aspect, for example. <laughs> uh, that, that was a question for Shane. Yes, and Shane answered it. <laughs> yeah, we answered it. <laughs> Very good. I mean, that must be expensive. So, uh, so who's paying for all that? Oh... I didn't thought of that. That that aspect of it suddenly uh, complicates matters immensely. Well, it brings us to the topic of this uh, week's episode, folks, where I'd like to have a a quick discussion about paying to play. Like, who pays when you sit down to play a game? Um, Obviously, games do not generally cost nothing. There's there's usually a a money investment, and that's uh, usually for a... uh, Well, in a previous life, it would have been for a rule book. Are for a board game. Um, and board games, I feel, are f- still fairly cut and dried. Someone has to own a copy of the game. But with a lot of popular uh, RPGs, uh, tabletop games, there is uh, there's going to be a core book, and then there might be uh, deluxe character sheets, custom dice, miniatures, battle mats, all sorts of paraphernalia that can be added on. Splat books for the the class of, of paladin you want to play, or a monster manual, or a sort of a, a tip sheet for, for GMs. But uh, what it does come down to is who's going to pay for all this? And obviously, the answer is uh, whoever's running the game. It's their job, after all. I mean, they're putting in the sweat equity and they're putting in the time, and they should, I mean, they want to run this game, and everyone else is basically doing them a favor by showing up. So it's up to them to, to foot the bill. Um, Thanks for joining us. Uh, we'll see you next week. So. <laughs> I think there might be a little bit of a uh, controversy there. Well, it, it it is sort of interesting though that uh, gaming has traditionally been a group activity, but has also been sort of based around physical things. It's it you someone owns this book, someone owns this copy of Axis and Allies, someone owns this, that, and the, and the other thing. Uh, so it's this always interesting where one person is taking on the critical financial burden of owning the thing, but uh, it's to be used by a group. And it can be used by multiple different groups, all with connections to the, to the owner. But it does raise the things like if you have a solid group and you, you're, you have a core group of players – Maybe we should be looking into ways to spread the burden. Now, some people have it easier. Uh, I sort of compare my current financially independent old person position life to when I started in the hobby as part of a college society. I went to college and there was a society that had its budget and it used that budget to buy games and those games were understood to be owned by the society for the use of all members uh, or anyone who's ha- who's coming along on the open days. Um, but not everyone can organize their five mates to that strong a degree. Although maybe they should is, I guess, one of the, the aspects we should be thinking about for this episode. I, I would say that this is frequently not really an issue because uh, in my experience, normally what game is being played is kind of chosen by the, the GM anyway, because that's the one that they've got um, enthusiasm about like and a desire to run the game. And if they've got that, then they want to own, or they already own, the, the core books at least. Um, so the c- problem often kind of resolves itself in that regard. Like somebody, somebody wants to both own the books and run the game. But do, you're asking uh, the central person, the GM for an RPG or the board game owner for a board game to take on not only the financial burden of buying the physical thing that makes the game happen, but also to take on the emotional labor of, guys, try this game. It'll be fun. It'll be fun. I Trust me. Trust me. 
Uh, is it not maybe a bit fairer that uh, groups maybe share this burden a bit? Well, the alternative is that the group approach the GM saying, we want to play this game that you're not particularly interested in, so we want you to put all the effort into learning it and running it and writing stories for it, and you don't care about it. Like, I don't, I don't, I haven't been there, but I can't imagine it results in such a satisfying experience as playing a game that maybe the players are less super enthused about, but that the GM is really into. Anybody got experience with that? Can't speak to that one, no, but uh, it's it would seem that... Uh, there's a in terms of the economics of of getting a game on the table, there has in the past at least been an, a burden, uh, a preponderance of, of financial burden has fallen on the person with the most enthusiasm, uh, as you say, the GM usually. Now it's the return shot to that scenario is, it's I mean if you have to bully people into playing a game that you're interested in playing, then they're probably not going to be great at the table anyways which is a, a poor use of your time and money. Uh, more often than not, let's assume that we have an enthusiastic uh, GM, an enthusiastic set of players, uh, but it's, we do then come to the, the tricky issue of well, who buys what. Uh, Owen, you've bought a game or two in your time, and you're definitely enthusiastic. Any thoughts on sort of how this has shaped up in the past and how it might shape up in the future generally speaking the gm pays for everything uh also does all the prep work also often hosts the game but not always so it depends i mean the thing is in gaming some people are students some people have limited financial resources so maybe somebody who's got a bit of a better job or a thing paying for the entertainment is acceptable like i i don't have a problem that i buy a lot of games i use most of them some of them I don't use. Uh, I try not to feel too guilty about play- buying games, not really getting much use out of them. Um, so yeah, like that happens. There are some games with a much higher cost of entry than others. Some games are going to cost you €40 Euros for a core book, and then you're done. You just have to print the card sheets, and you've already got dice. Some games require custom dice. They require like lots of bells and whistles. Uh, yeah. The person who... If you're going to go, let's play this game with lots of bells and whistles, you should probably be the person taking on most of the financial burden. I remember when we were going to play Star Wars, the new FFG edition, um, I basically, the person who was going to run it was buying the rule books, and I said, guys, it is everybody's responsibility to buy one pack of dice each. Because these are all custom dice. Mm, I, I, I said, I remember this. everybody yep, yep. has to buy one pack of dice. They Could will go on a communal... for love no money. I ended up buying a bunch of... Uh, well, so for a bunch of people in England. And I was like, this is... I said, this is the best way to handle this. Because then we're not... We'll have a bunch of dice. We won't be fucking fighting over dice. Yeah. And the GM is not being stung for 80 euro or 100 euro worth of dice to get his game going as well. I don't know how many times I went into our local friendly game store looking for those damn yeah. dice. Oh, they're, they're a pain to get. So that's a factor, definitely. Uh, if you can spread some of the cost off the poor old GM, that's a good thing. Sorry, there are, there are often other, th- other things that uh, everybody at the table kind of basically needs to have some uh, a, a copy of. Like, uh, for some games, it's the, it's the player's handbook, you know, the, the rules. Um, and in, that, in those cases, I would say that uh, unless they're really financially stuck, uh, you should certainly have... You know, at least like one copy between two, anyway, at the table. Yeah, the return on investment there is is like you're going to sit down week after week with this book, and it, it maybe it costs 25, 30 quid, depending on what, where you're buying it. But uh, that very quickly becomes pennies per session if you're uh, if you're going to get a good long campaign out of it. And presumably, it's you know that investment then carries over into other games uh, in, in that system. Um, I suppose I kind of I've thrown this argument onto the uh, the table, uh, not argument but proposition because it's things have changed, folks. Uh, in the year 2020, we had an opportunity to stay home and play a lot more games. Uh, as a result, we have taken to the virtual tabletops uh, en masse, and this has, I believe, given us an, a new economy of gaming. That there's a lot more things to pay for, but there's an awful lot more ways to pay and to play. So perhaps we can look at some of those now in terms of the... And with the addition that they add an awful lot more bells and whistles, uh, which traditionally fell into the uh, the pocket of the, the GM. So are we all playing virtually at this point? 
I'm yes. still relying on Discord, but it still counts as far as I'm concerned. Very good. <laughs> um, so yeah, we've we've all had a taste of playing online, and I believe I mean there's four of us here today. I'd say we have four different versions of this in terms of how we stitch it all together. Uh, so who's dropped money into the pot to get their games up and running? Uh, I have purchased a Foundry VTT license, which is all we needed to buy because we're using Foundry. If we were doing Roll20 or uh, Fantasy Grounds, we would need to be buying either... like There are licenses for use for players, and there are also ones where you need to uh, buy... like. The rules to use in the uh, to use in the oak. Uh, how about how about you, Scar? Uh, I'm well. I'm naturally one of the people who will take on extra financial burden and emotional labor uh, for the benefit of others. Um, I've sort of gone with the. Um, try to make it as low effort because I've been uh, running very mixed groups so I'll have one set of players who will happily buy their own books for their own purposes um, give advice to others uh, and uh, you know you know, pay for character portraits or extra character sheets or whatnot. but then there'll be other newer players who I feel it's better to not financially burden anyway so uh, I, I make sure that they're they have everything they need and I specifically choose uh, freer freer software like discord because even if it makes it a little bit more fiddly to play uh, to uh, to run everything and they don't have all the bells and whistles it's uh, it's much easier for people who don't have, say, the internet resources. There's, like, Discord okay. isn't perfect, but it, it's a lot easier to run than uh, a high-end VTT. And uh, how about you, efficient cyborg, Shane? Have uh, you been playing online? <laughs> what are you using, and what are you paying for? Yeah, well, um, so th- this is a continuation of the same game that we've had going on for a while. We've just had to move uh, to the virtual t- um, well realm. Um so the GM of this uh, is the least financially flexible of the lot of us. Um, and uh, I, I had previously been GMing. Uh, it's Star Wars. I don't know the Star Wars setting inside out and backwards. Um, so I'd step back from it and uh, one of the players took over GMing. So I just gave him my books, basically. I mean, I suppose they still technically belong to me, but they haven't been in my possession for at least a year. Um, and... <laughs> Yeah, like we, we certainly could have looked for um, a, you know, a, a proper uh, designed online gaming system uh, to to handle what we need to do. But um, I suppose because kind of it comes down to the GM to to lead on that kind of thing uh, by default, um, and he didn't want to put any money into it. Uh, it just defaulted to Skype. So uh, no, there hasn't been any cost except I suppose maybe one or two of the players who didn't already own. Um, the appropriate dice had to had to then go get them because they're stuck in their own house. Mm. Let's see, yeah, it's, um, and certainly the the bells and whistles that come with kind of custom elements of games do tend to throw some of the cost back onto the the players. In turn, you know, as you should have your own copy of a player's handbook, or you should have your own um, sort of attack cards or uh, special dice, or mm. whatever. Especially, I... yeah, there's, certainly we saw a few systems that. Encourage, excuse me. Certainly, we saw a few systems that uh, encouraged that uh, sort of thing. Uh, and I, then, I f- go ahead. No, I was just going to say it's an interesting how this has sorted of, the the cost proposition of uh, RPGs versus board games has sort of reversed uh, in the era of COVID. Uh, in that, games that require a lot on physical uh, pieces like. Uh, a board game or a fancy flight uh fancy flight uh rpg have sort of been hobbled a little whereas what would normally have been the uh, the big investment pieces for a player like uh a D or another rpg 
sort of have the advantage of, well, people now have to, it's a lot easier to get words to your door than a gigantic uh, box set board game. Um, so the PDF market has really opened up in uh, of late and uh, they're doing gangbusters just selling uh, regular rule books, but also it had helped them uh, encourage uh, people to uh, try other uh, PDF products. Yeah. As, and PDFs tend to come in at a fairly low price point, depending on, on what you're buying. Uh, so it's it's less of a burden uh, when people are asked to sort of pitch in something. Yeah, compared to even five years ago, there's an awful lot more free RPGs available. Um, yes. After all, you there is a perfectly functional version of uh, D&D 5th Ed available for free. Right? People often overlook this and consider and say that, oh, you have to get all three you have to get all three books for the GM and the, uh, uh, the all the players need to have PHBs but if you've got a GM with a, a bit of uh, know-how and experience, really you could run the entire thing with everyone having a copy of the basic rules on their phone. Quite possibly, yeah. And there are a lot of other uh, free and low-cost RPGs. Uh, Fa- Fate is actually pay what you want these days. Uh, obligatory reference to a uh, fellow party member Ice Cream. Why? What's he do? Uh, he had a an incident with a Fate game that he tried to run. He, he ran Fate oh. for a while. He modified the system at uh, his own risk. Uh, I had a hand in that. It didn't I didn't help. And uh, eventually he got the whole show back on the road and finished out a very satisfying campaign after about a year and a half. Mm. But he's kind of sworn off fate. Yeah. <laughs> oh, see. It is, That's it, what we're using for Star Wars now, and it's, it's going pretty well. <laughs> it definitely yeah. requires you to, to recalibrate your expectations as to, to what a system is going to do. Yeah. But it, it well, certainly uh, has some As, we, as now, we covered in a recent episode. And it has <laughs> custom dice. So, you know, it's it's <laughs> one of these things that, uh, one of these systems in the past, people were sort of, oh, I need to buy a thing. Um, my own yeah. experience pre and post pandemic has been interesting in terms of who's paying for what. Uh, I was, as regular listeners will know, I was very uh, fond of running sort of a craft D&D so that there was always a, a new thing on the table every week for the players to move their miniatures around uh, and very much sort of either uh, physical sort of made objects or, or purchased terrain uh, and then showpiece stuff that I would spend uh, time, effort and of course uh, some finances on putting together to really make a, the, the table zing. Now that's obviously uh, not possible in the, in the current uh, crisis, call it that, but... Uh, even back, even back at the when we were playing around a tabletop, we were using D and D Beyond for uh, a lot of things, and we were using a lot of account sharing, which is a wonderful feature D and D Beyond, where if one person pays for a premium account, they can then share those features with the other people, and that's we see that in a lot of the the virtual tabletop stuff as well, where all you need is one person who's willing to to throw in a bit of money and the whole party benefits. And my experience has been that that is something that gets shared around a lot once once you sort of open up that conversation with your with the rest of your adventure group. It's you very quickly find that people are only too happy to offer money, certainly, but probably more importantly, they go and find something that they think is going to be a good addition to the game, be it a, a supplement or a a tool, maybe a premium uh, voice chat channel or they'll pop a bit of money in for the deluxe special effects on your virtual tabletop. Uh, and you and everybody benefits at that point because everybody's almost going off and doing their own research and maybe scratching their own itch. Uh, and you can end up with uh, something that is more than some of its parts because you've got a, a richness of, uh, of tools and resources to draw upon. It's, uh, it's been very... Okay. Yep. Uh, what, what about the... Um... The, the physical equivalent of that now. So when when you want to have your uh, like expensive tiles and dungeon walls and three D printed dungeon furniture and miniatures uh, for your monsters and all this kind of thing, like obviously the players benefit from it, but then you end up owning a thing at the end. So how much is reasonable to expect the players to contribute to enhancing their experience 
and also enhancing your uh, dragon's treasure hoard of gaming material that you sleep on? That's it's a great question. Um, I think yeah, there's the, it. It really comes down to what's your fetish. Uh, for me, it is absolutely making a uh, dungeon. Dungeons and Dragons style uh, s- scenery. I'm working on a ruined chapel now for no particular reason. I don't know when I'll ever use it, uh, but I'm I'm kind of considering how to make a pew. And it was one of those things that they climb up on and, and deliver the sermon from. Um, cloister? No, that's not right. Anyways, pulpit. a pulpit. Exactly. I'm working on a miniature pulpit at the moment, uh, and that was true uh, when we were gathered around the table. What my players did in that instance was they were looking at all of this terrain that I was pumping out, and a few of them said to themselves, "Oh, this is this is worth uh, this is worth it getting in on." And they headed over to Hero Forge, I believe is the name of the company. And ah. a couple of weeks, a couple of months after we started the campaign. A couple of players showed up and, and with great ceremony unboxed their custom miniatures for the characters that they'd rolled up for ah. uh, the game we were running. And that's, that's for them. That's a, uh, these are, these are not inexpensive models, folks. These are, I think with shipping included, we were looking at sort of the thick end of 40 quid for a, a 32 inch miniature. But they were absolute. <laughs> I know, I, I know. But, and it has to be said, you, it's, there's, there's something you said for looking down at the table you've created and seeing the characters they've created as realized by those players using 3D printing mm. and, and uh, virtual sort of miniature makers. And I have to say, like, that was, it's very hard to put a number on how that enhances a game. But for my money, at least, it was a real vindication of the time, effort, and money I'd spent on creating what is, I mean, it's a fairly shoddy collection of, of modular parts and the odd set piece. But uh, it was it was something else to see uh, custom characters who were living in that world who we were you know every week we were returning to their adventures and they were there on the table along with my own efforts. Um, so, but yeah, to, to answer your question, uh, if if you're gonna well in the, if you're gonna buy the miniatures, buy the gear and stuff like that, that's kind of on you. No one asked you to do it, but um, it is vindication certainly to see other people coming along for the ride in in the wrong way. And I've had players bring along terrain and offer it for use that they've spent time making or that they've purchased. So there's been, because I'm, I'm lucky enough to, to be in a group that has a few other people that are running games as well. So, um, and that's bled over into the virtual tabletop that I'm able to piggyback on some of their, uh, their sort of setups and their accounts. I am very much a hand me down GM in the virtual space. Uh, and I'm hugely appreciative of uh, of the efforts they've made and their generosity, uh, because I think as GMs you can often sort of feel like, oh, well, I'm shouldering all of this. But even th- open that conversation up even slightly, and generally, I think you'll find there's a lot of fellow feeling and appreciation, and then uh, generosity that will come from your table. Uh, all you have to do really is ask. Any uh, anyone want to throw in any recommendations for for ways you can share the costs? Well, I, I've never done this, but a kitty sounds like a good idea because often it's like I've just spent a tenner on printing or something like that, which, you know, is is a noticeable amount of money. Uh, but then when, when you come around to like, right, everybody chip in two quid, please, that seems kind of petty. <laughs> um, mm. and, and therefore it just doesn't really get done or, or followed up on. Um, so may, may, maybe everybody pre-investing would be a way yeah. to do it. I think mm. actually like board game groups sort of have an advantage over uh, RPG groups here because... As uh, Savage has been intimating, uh, RPG groups tend to have a strong leader type to whom everyone looks, whereas board game groups tend to tend to be more equal. Seems to be is a, is a pretty reductive way of putting it, but they they have the idea that everyone will have their own little collection and will share it between them. So I, I guess it depends on your group organization. I think. If you want to have a group that shares costs between them, then you're going to have to have some group conversations about it. But also, it it behooves the group to then remember everyone's individual circumstances. Maybe one person can get uh, printing for free at work or something uh, and can uh, do all the character sheets and stuff. Or maybe, maybe someone has uh, no real spending money for books, but maybe they can host uh, maybe someone can provide meals. Oh, meals! Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, I've, I've 
fond memories. There's the question of divided division of like financial uh, burden, but also just like the emotional burden. Like who should have the keen is a pretty it's a thornier question and harder to put in one's pocket. You, you know, you can't pay for rule books with keen, despite how much people w- wish it were so. But it, I think group discussions about, well, what are we passionate about? Like, are we going to force uh, Jimmy the GM to uh, buy 120 bo- uh, worth of books and supplements for a game we're going to run for five weeks? Like, yikes. Just having this sort of group awareness of what are we trying to run and maybe adjust your perceptions of what you should spend based on what you want to run. Like if this group is going to, if this group wants to run for five weeks and then split up and never see each other again, maybe just buy like Lost Minds of Faldover, everyone chip in a fiver. Uh, but if your your lifelong friends uh, that are uh, that are you know bonded at the hip, uh, maybe altered. Uh, ways of doing this uh, are possible. Have a discussion about who gets to keep it afterwards when you're done. Yeah. yeah. Before yeah. you do anything, say, okay, we're all chipping in a fiver, or we're all chipping in a tenner, we're buying the base rule book, or we're all stipping in 20 and we're buying two copies of the base rule book. Uh, the GM gets to keep one, we'll roll a dice or something for the one at the end. Have a yeah. discussion or, about that before. Agree, agree to a buyout at the end of the, yeah. the campaign. So mm-hmm. you know, whoever has mm-hmm. actually discovered that it's their the campaign they were always, the game system they were always looking for is just going to reimburse some yeah. of the other uh, some of the other members of the group. Because one of the other things is just to raise that some people in uh, role playing and gaming are very generous or like will are prepared to toss their money around like me. Uh, other people are more parsimonious with their money. Other people are more restricted in their money. And some people are just cheapskates. You can't overlook that. Uh, so some people are perfectly willing to go along to a game, play a game thing, but would balk at throwing any money in. So you have to be ready for that as well. You can you can say, oh, it'll be reasonable for everyone to throw two quid in or a fiver in. And one person will be like, oh, I can't afford that. And like you said, you you know, you, you, you pull down a six-figure salary. Yes, but I can't afford it. Sorry, look, you know, things are tough. You know, and uh, that's the okay. you know that that happens too. So just be aware, be aware that um, that might, you might get someone who's unreasonable on the topic, and that happens. That happens. Just just be aware. Right. What about um? And this is a somewhat recent development. Uh, something where there isn't anything to own at the end. Uh, the legacy board games I'm thinking of. Um, have, has anybody played those? And if so, how was the group assembled? And who did the paying? I did the paying. I kept it afterwards. It's still a board game. It still works, but it's just it's done. You can still run normal Pandemic or Betrayal with it. You can run a custom version of Pandemic or Betrayal with it afterwards, which is kind of your version. Like you Mm. know, we've got our names for the diseases. Then the the map is different. That that sort of stuff. But the thing is, look, the way I see it with a legacy board game is it's usually calibrated for fifteen to twenty plays. If I get 15 to 20 plays out of a board game, I have done well ahead of... I usually get two or three plays out of a board game. So, you know, I am super happy if I got uh, 20 out of it. That board game got played. Yeah, but three other people also got 20 out of it. They did. And they got it for free? They did. Is that fair? Look, fair is... There's no fair in the world. Fair is what we make, you know? Um, (laughs) What what do you think the answer is there, Eva Robot Shane? Uh, Well, I... uh, I don't know. I mean, to, to me, it doesn't matter a whole lot because, yeah, well, like Owen, if I've gotten that amount of enjoyment out of the game, then I, I don't mind that it cost me whatever uh, they cost these days. But um, the only legacy game that I've played, uh, I, I wasn't the person who bought it uh, and was not asked to contribute. And, and that's fine. I'm just wondering what people's experiences of it are. Because, like, I think, you know, we're probably all at a similar stage in life and that comes with a certain amount of disposable income. But, like, there's going to be out of the several people who listen to this, maybe some of them won't be in that situation. Just yeah. actually, as a question here, right? Who would be up for, okay, I'm going to run a new game, I'm going to buy the new core book, and it's 50 euros. Would everyone be kind of, I'm okay with that, That that's fine. That, that as I, in, 
splitting it or no like just you're the GM you're going to run it so you're like oh, I'm going to play this it's going to be 50 euros so I'm going to buy it everyone will think, be kind of yeah, yeah that's fair abs- absolutely yeah. I would be happy if they're happy to do it uh, but I also wouldn't be afraid to chip in if it's if it's me uh, if it's something that I, I want to see happen I would definitely be happy to sp- even split even if it was just me I would happy to go 50-50 on a really interesting game I'm I'm sort of I'm looking at that and thinking to myself okay well that's I'll play that game certainly I if that person wants to own that rulebook outright and isn't looking for contributions in that sense I'm always going to look for some other way I can add value and that might be something as simple as showing up with snacks for the table uh, which you know is is not an instance of, when you see the way that gamers will go through a bag of buttered popcorn <laughs> it's uh, it can it's not an insubstantial uh, investment over the course of a campaign yeah um, and you know and i've i've been lucky again to be part of various gaming groups where there was a uh, sort of a community effort there so, i mean there was occasions when we'd simply have more than could be consumed and that entered a sort of a a gaming uh larder that was drawn from every week and would occasionally get topped up yeah you you'd be surprised how much you can build up in a week like someone buys 10 euros worth of snacks for the game and another person is a taxi who brings everyone to the game place you very easily end up with uh the gm who bought the book might actually have come out the best out of that financially (laughs) Could do. Could do. Very true. How about if it was a three book set and it was going to run you about 140, 130 euros? That was the key books for that you needed to run it. Like, would you be, would you be okay as a GM on your own doing that? Um, I, I think there were two scenarios kind of there. One is that you, uh, you already know the game and you know that you're going to want to run it. Um, and the other is that you don't know the game, but you're willing to invest this money anyway, potentially. Um, like, you know, in order to prepare, you're going to want to be reading these books while sitting on the toilet or falling asleep on them and dribbling and, and stuff like that. Like, you just, you need to own them in order to prepare, to to know all the rules and all the setting background. Because I think the game that raised the most hackles recently when it came out, in uh, terms of point of entry and spurred these discussions, was Invisible Sun from Monty Cook, which was an oh, yeah. eye-watering $250 uh, cube that oh, you had to yeah, buy. Oh, yeah, the cube. And if you wanted more than, I think, three or four players, you needed to buy uh, these extra Vizlay kits, which were another set of player materials. And that's had some... It's a bit of very expensive, very deluxe RPG. And the, and it really raised uh, unfortunate questions about... Well, no, difficult questions. It was like, I really feel dodgy about playing this, buying, paying this much on my own. Is it acceptable to split with my group and say, okay, everyone toss in 50, we'll get this and we'll play it and we'll have an experience, you know? Yeah, yeah I, th- I think where there's equal, um, where you have a group that are equally invested in terms of wanting to play it, but obviously someone has to run it, um, and they all, say, chip in the same amount, It you can't ignore the fact that ultimately there is one person at that table who's going to have put in an awful lot more of something that you simply cannot get any more of, and that's time. Um now they there's a pressure on them once everyone's chipped in to do a bloody good job of presenting the material in its best possible light um and i think the reward for that should be that ultimately the physical ownership if there is a physical product would reside with them ha- after they've contributed the same amount of money but they've put in a disproportionate amount of time to make sure that uh, the game as played lived up to the the quality of the product as purchased. I'm also in mind of some of the very very deluxe editions of things like uh, Dragon Heist, Waterdeep Dragon Heist that were put out with you know custom like handmade handouts and large format character portraits and all sorts of things that ran to so I'm thinking like north of three hundred dollars for some of this stuff. Um, these were these are major investments for any gaming group. For example, I paid to about two hundred and fifty euros for an extra copy of the Cthulhu book, the complete Mask of Nalar Thotep box set, and the Nalar Thotep the the prop set that uh, the HP Lovecraft Society did. I ran that. We had a great time. It really enhanced the play of the game. Uh, we played the game. It was a full year campaign. It ran. That turned out to be very cheap. 
in terms of entertainment for Euro value for me. And for the players, it was incredible entertainment for Euro value because I didn't ask them to pay anything. But like that's that and that that was good value. But there is a risk when you buy something like that and it's a lemon, and then you've you've all chipped in money. You feel you kind of have to keep going with it. You know, it's it's an interesting what, what sort of cost the, fallacy. Uh, what was the legacy game? The pirate legacy game. Oh, uh, Seafall. Seafall. Seafall that went for multiple hundreds when it was released, and you can pick it up now for about twenty quid. I went for about eighty when it was released. Yeah. Oh, once it hit eBay, it was it got kind of stupid for a while. Okay, well, I mean, there's yes, the the risk the risk of failure, the risk of making a bad purchase is something that exists whether you are buying an ice cream or a, a Cadillac. Um, I think it's been illuminating talking to you all about your sort of the various aspects of this. It's probably something that every gaming group should have a, a grown up discussion about when they sit, first sit yeah, down. Yeah, I. I- I think talking about it beforehand is probably the way to go, whether the GM like buys two shares to everybody else's one and then gets to keep it afterwards or something, as long as that's on the table beforehand. Yeah, and yeah. a group shouldn't be afraid to cheap out if it works out in the end. You can play Dominion or Settlers of Catan for free, and there's all kinds of free RPGs, as I said. There was Fate, there's uh, a bunch of OSR books are available, basic rules for free. Uh, take any any of the humble bundles or bag of holding bundles. Oh, There's yeah. always always options. I've I've more well, RPG sets. Some people should have about seventeen hundred video games and RPGs uh, <laughs> after the Black Lives Matter bundle right now. So uh, yeah, go I've, I'm still digging through that. Through that incredible list of I don't even. Do you know what, I, I do you know what matters? That link. Shane, do you know what matters? Indexing matters. <laughs> <laughs> they really they really do need to put some way of sorting that. Uh, on the on the front of the bundle, okay, folks. It's been it's it's been a, a fruitful conversation. I think we can all take something valuable from it. Um, yes, thanks for joining both us financially Money. and emotionally. This has been Scar, who is the the current Shane, uh, legacy uh, rebooted evil robot Shane, who has it's, been our, our no, guest. He has a premium price. I've changed and valueless now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, new additions don't mean the old ones aren't worth anything. Uh, <laughs> we uh, Hiro Owen joining us uh, from the. From the other side of the internet, and uh, my name has been Savage Mick. Uh, you can find us on YouTube, Discord, uh, Twitch, Twitter, Twitch. No, we're not on Twitch. What have, what have I said? Uh, we're on Twitter. Making we're promises. On Speakpipe. There's a whole bunch of links to the show notes. Uh, but for now, uh, with everybody chipping something in, this party's over. Thanks for listening to the Adventuring Party. You can find show notes and links to things we've mentioned at www.theadventuringparty.net and on our Facebook page. You can leave comments there or talk to our Twitter account at AdventuryPTUI or you can record a voice message at www.speakpipe.com slash theadventuringparty. The hosts can be contacted directly by email at Owen, Savage, Shade or Scar, two R's, the real one, at theadventuryparty.net If you'd like to be in touch with the party all the time, come join our Discord server, link in the show notes. The Adventuring Party is released under Creative Commons, Attribution, Non-Commercial, Share Alike, Version 3 License.